All right, let's talk about the preseason game that just unfolded between Adelaide and West Coast in a game we were unsurprisingly comprehensively beaten. Now, uh, for context, I did explain during the week I didn't catch this game in real time because it was on so early and I had a night out the day before. So hence this pretty tardy video about the game, but I've had time to catch up on it. I did my best this morning. I woke up at about eight, deliberately didn't open Instagram, deliberately didn't open my messages, trying to avoid the score because I thought it would be better to be able to properly emotionally invest in the game, which you could argue for a preseason game is kind of pointless. But uh, as it happens, as soon as you open KO, I have the setting on where it tells you the score. So I did see the final score before I had actually watched a single second of the game, which again, I don't, I don't know if that's better or worse for, for the sake of analysis. So I was pretty withdrawn, but to be honest, I will say one thing. If I'm honest, when I saw us lose 117 to 50, 67 points, I gotta say I was a little relieved, which is stupid because on paper, that is not a great result. Uh, that being said, it is kind of in line with what you would expect a real season game between these two sides to go, right? Like if we're realistic. Adelaide are a far better side, far stronger side. That's kind of the scoreline you would expect. Um, and, you know, I have some bad memories of last year waking up to Eagles games, whether I'd be traveling or if the games were on at like stupid o'clock here, where I'd wake up and see the score. And on a few occasions, the score was horrific. So yeah, it's funny to, to think that the, the first reaction that I had was one of relief. But let's talk about the actual game. Now, obviously, we were beaten pretty comprehensively in most metrics. Yeah, Adelaide are a much more advanced and strong football side and this game played out more or less how you'd expect. I won't necessarily go through this game, you know, finding all the negatives that were. So let's talk about some things that are notable and I have some positives and negatives. So I suppose on the positive side, you know, like we had way less of the ball, like I said, beaten in pretty much every metric except tackles. Now they possessed a lot more of the footy than us in this game. It was like 400 plus to about 270. So you'd kind of expect we also wouldn't get out tackled. That being said, tackling has been such a weakness for this side that it wouldn't be uncommon for us to lose the disposal count and the tackle count heavily. So the fact that we out-tackled them does speak to this notion that we are trying to become more physical, contested, and defensively minded across the ground. So you got to give us a little bit of a tick for that. That is at least progress in something that we were particularly poor at before. We also had significantly more inside 50s than last week. I forget the exact number. I think we had 44. Now, while that is still not strong when you compare it to you know other AFL averages, it is more than what we averaged last year where we were extremely poor. So that is at least two areas where despite the fact we lost heavily on the scoreboard, we out-tackled them. We had more inside 50s than we usually do. And we, that's what we're looking for here, right? Progress. Now we'll temper this by saying, you know, like while we haven't had two amazing performances in the preseason so far, I've obviously sort of swept it under the rug to some extent, pointing out that it is preseason. And I realize the reverse logic also applies just because we had improvement in a preseason game. Obviously it doesn't matter that much, but we'll give credit where it's due. There, that is improvement in two areas that we were previously poor in and hopefully we can translate to the season. So uh, in terms of individuals, like Tim Kelly was by far and away our best player in this game. We had a goal, 26 touches, 660 meters gained and that is all the more impressive considering he only had 74% time on ground. I'm not sure we would average normally, but probably above 85. So really healthy numbers. And once again, he's a workhorse and I shudder to think what this midfield would look like without Tim Kelly in the team. Brady Hoff was another standout for me, you know, certainly made some mistakes, but I think he has risen to the level of being a reliable AFL footballer already after 30 games. And that has definitely impressed me. And I think that the recruiters deserve a lot of credit for plucking Brady Hoff out of the Southwest Footy League. Well, he was actually drafted at appeal, but you know, 12 months prior to that Southwest Footy League and was taken a little bit earlier than people expected in the draft and, and just shows the confidence. I think that's what stands out about him. It's, it's the confidence he has in himself to take the game on, to fly for those marks, to use the ball creatively. Yeah, there were some mistakes, but God, I, I just feel so confident that Brady Hoff is going to be a quality player. And he legitimately could be, you know, top five in the best and fairest this year if you extrapolate what we've seen so far. I think he's been fantastic. He's been thrown in a variety of different roles. And the 22 under 22 prediction that I made, is that's looking good. I mean, there's some healthy competition for that, but Brady Hoff is a good, good player. Let's talk about Harley Reid as well. Um, you know, by far and away an improved performance and to get 20 touchdowns, I actually wrote down what he got here. 20 disposals, eight of those contested, five clearances and three tackles is a very healthy number. So again, you know, preseason, but he's incrementally just sort of like 
had bigger challenges each week. You know, his first central club, he looked good in a game where stats were recorded, but he looked good, which is more intense than, say, match simulations or drills. That's a step up. And then from intra club, you've got the preseason game against Fremantle and then against Adelaide. You know, again, it's, it's a tougher level of competition. Adelaide, not only a better team than Fremantle, but they also specifically targeted him. He got a lot of attention. There's some great footage out there. Laird's wrestling him on the ground and Reed manages to switch the situation and get on top of Laird, which... It's funny because Elliot Yo goes to help out, but like at the point that Yo reaches Harley, it looks almost at the point where Rory Laird needs the help, not Harley Reid, which just speaks to how strong this kid is. And yeah, some decent midfield time in there. And, um, you know, nothing like game breaking, no game breaking highlights, but he certainly is a player where like every touch he gets, he just sort of puts us in a slightly better position. He just has that poise, you know, he can break out of a stoppage and then stop on a dime and has a really small turning circle and he just chips a well-weighted pass to Tim Kelly. That was another highlight for me. And it's nice that, you you know, he can also do the things that get highlights. And uh, to be fair, he did have one fend off as well. But he also does the little things like that and just gets us in a slightly better position with pretty much every possession. Sort of like Noah Long. Speaking of Noah Long, again, looks great with the ball in hand. Just the 11 touches today. Um, but again, you know, playing forward or high half forward in a team that was well beaten. Kind of par for the course, but he just continued that trend of every time he gets the ball, he puts us in a better position. I really did think McGovern coming back into the side did really make us look a lot more rock solid down back. I think he had six touches but only 60% time on ground I think they pulled him for the last quarter and just structurally just having both McGovern and Barras and McGovern playing well just makes us look a lot more robust down back. Darling had two goals and eight possessions, but yeah, I think there were moments in that game where he kind of looked better than 2023. So again, small sample size, first look at it after that hamstring injury, and hopefully he can just be a competitive, reliable player, doesn't need to kick 45 goals this year. But he certainly showed signs of being a better version than the 2023 version of Darling, so hopefully he can carry that into the season. Luke Edwards also had a game where pretty much everything he did put us in a slightly better position. Again, not a game breaker by any stretch and had the 17 touches and a goal but the goal he kicked was nice and shows that he does have that ability to stay poised in the moment if that makes sense that's how I would describe Luke Edwards he just sort of doesn't play fast but sort of has that knack of being able to slow down time when he gets the ball I'm not saying he's Scott Pendlebury but that is definitely a trait that Luke Edwards have I would just like to see him get a little bit more of the footy and a plus here that it probably went missed Alex Witherden actually did have a very good game uh, I noticed he had 17 touches and over 500 meters gained so for that amount of touches that is a lot of meters gained and I think that was second most on field other than Tim Kelly. So another interesting thing here as a little bit of a segue is there was also the Waffle game where Jermaine Jones was picked in the Waffle side to play against East Fremantle. Now they got well beaten as well as, as you'd expect. They had five AFL listed players and against the reigning premiers in East Fremantle. But it is interesting that Jermaine Jones was selected both in the second half of that preseason derby after like the four quarters finish and then also lines up for us in the Waffle. That does suggest he's definitely dropped down the pecking order and it kind of speaks to a depth of medium defensive options. Like we have a lot of evenly rated medium defensive options and Jermaine Jones would have been my preference to play round one, but he definitely seems to have fallen out of favor. And I don't think it's a fitness thing considering how many players in this game against Adelaide, you know, had limited minutes. So Jermaine Jones could have easily played that game. So there's just something interesting to note there. So I've plucked a lot of positives there and I do think that reflects the fact that I don't think there's any reason to get too negative about that result, but I will point out a few bad things about this game. Like Bailey Williams had a horrific game like he had one possession that is insane Barnett had way less game time had nearly the same amount of hit outs and you know an extra possession on Williams so I don't know what happened there I don't want to blow this out of proportion I, I do think Bailey Williams is going to be vulnerable against those big physical rucks like a Riley O'Brien and he had, he's coming off a great year so I'm not going to spin it negatively but it, it was a bad game I felt like Petricelli had an almost game you know took a strong mark from memory uh, kicked a couple of goals and then a couple of times ran into traffic got caught you really do get the sense with Petch he needs to be in a good team to look good but there are there's enough to suggest that there for me. I think he's probably close to the best 22. Tom Cole had a bit of a shocker. Again, you know, like how much do you read into it? Some of them were just like, well, there was one particularly bad turnover, like right in front of goal that he had. And again, it's preseason. So hopefully it's just the cobwebs, but he wasn't great. And generally the last quarter. Now, again, I don't really care that much. The last quarter, the intensity of it was completely off. You know, they did take Rankin out of the game. We took a few players out ourselves and the score ballooned out a little bit, but we were only five goals down with five minutes to go in the third. So if our games in reality go like that during the season where we're okay for three and a half quarters and we go quiet in the last quarter, we don't want that to be normal. But if that's the worst it gets, then I can live with that. But again, the intensity was so low that it was actually a really boring last quarter to watch. I was making breakfast while watching and I was going, do I even need to watch this final quarter? 
Kickstarter to make a video about the game, which is not to try and sweep it under the rug because I, like I said, I could see us doing that in the season, but I don't know how much there is to take out of that last quarter because it was so low intensity. A couple of other medium points. Uh, I think Gaff was passable. You know, I've been critical on Andrew Gaff, as have many. Um, and, you know, he didn't really make too many mistakes, just generally sort of accumulated on the outside, got his 20 touches. Still guilty of the blind long bomb, but to be honest, that is also a product of us being in bad positions when Andrew Gaff gets the ball. It's not as though we're finding him in acres of space and he's streaming inside 50 and he just bombs it long. He, it's constantly in a situation where we're hemmed in against the boundary and he's bombing it long for territory. So again, I think Gaff has sort of been relegated to this position in our squad where he's just a mature body experience. Won't improve us in a significant way when he's playing, but hopefully won't make mistakes and, and stand out for being bad in, in the way that he did in 2023. And also give Callum Jamison some credit as well. Um, again, I have no real expectations on Jamison because, you know, he's a, he's a Ruckman KPD convert and, you know, throwing him into the back line in this, this preseason, actually, it would have been reasonable to expect he would have had, you know, his colors lowered. But I think he showed some growth and I'm pleased for that. We definitely need some key positional depth. And while I wouldn't be comfortable with him playing round one as our key defender, there was enough to suggest that, you know, with a bit of momentum in the waffle, maybe in a year or two, he is capable of playing at AFL level as a key position defender. Again, it feels like whatever we get from Jamison is a bonus. I do like the kid and I would like to give him credit for, you know, a couple of nice moments in this game. So that's probably all I can realistically analyze from this game. In terms of players to come back, um, Oscar Allen and Tyler Brockman come to mind. I'd imagine both of those teams, well, certainly Oscar and, and perhaps Brockman as well, come straight back into the team. I have no idea the severity of Brockman's injury, but the fact that he didn't play either preseason games suggests there is a chance he's not right for round one. But we do have a fortnight. There's opening round next week and then the whole week after that until we play. So fingers crossed. It'd be nice to see Brockman in Eagles colors. As for content on this channel this week, guys, uh, I'm going to do two videos for West Coast prior to the start of the season, I'm going to make a video saying these are the reasons why West Coast could improve this year. And then on balance, I will make a separate video for reasons why we might not improve. I'm also going to do a video predicting our best and fairest this year. I think that could be a lot of fun. I think we could see some different names in there. And also eventually I'll do a best 22 for round one, uh, taking into account who's available and who's not. But let me know in the comments, guys, what you think of the game and I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.